So welcome, now that we've done a little bit of um, house cleaning. Dalesford Discusses is an ongoing um, forum where we bring up ideas about, about wellness and about the um, environment and about things that we particularly love at Dalesford and discuss them in a very informal, open way. And I can't tell you how thrilled I am that we've basically had our hands bitten off by talking about the English garden. This is clearly gardening, gar uh, our mental health associated with gardening and garden and beauty and what that brings into our lives could have been entered then by this astounding panel we have tonight. I'm completely, Sue, I got your book the day that it came out. <laughs> so, um, now as I hand you over to our panelists who are in, um, who I'll get to just quickly introduce themselves to you. So, Sue, could we start? Yes, Rhea, um, I think you just broke up, but I think you wanted me to introduce myself. Mm -hmm. So just quickly, um, I'm Sue Stewart-Smith. I'm a psychiatrist and psychotherapist. Uh, and my book, The Well Garden Mind, which came out in April last year, and which has just come out in paperback, really brings together the two sides of my life, my professional life uh, on the one hand, and also my home life, my gardening life uh, with my uh, garden designer husband, Tom, at the, barn, at the barn where we live in Hertfordshire. Fantastic. And Hazel, can you hear me? Yes, you're, you're, you're breaking up, um, right? I heard you say my name. <laughs> I'm hoping that. <laughs> so would you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Hazel, and uh, um, I formed a company called Hazel Gardener Design, uh, actual name. And I am a floor designer, um, passionate gardener, and um, broadcaster. And my um, journey with flowers started when I was very, very ill, probably about 15 years ago. I, I had cancer and that kind of changed my life in so many different ways uh, and it led me to career in floristry and to retrain and I'm very passionate about um, seasonality, gardening and just really promoting the benefits of flowers and being outside for our mental health. That's amazing. I had no idea that there was a personal health journey woven into what you do. Mm -hmm. That's Amazing. M Millie, Millie, would you mind introducing yourself, please? Hello, uh, I'm Millie Proust, and I am a really small scale flower grower. Um, and I use all the stems that I grow here uh, to create floral designs for weddings, events, and during COVID, nationwide bouquets to lovely local customers and um, further afield nationwide now. And we also have the wonderful land gardeners. Henry, to introduce yourselves. Oh, okay. Well, um, yes, we are the land gardeners, and um, we are. Um, um, I'm Henrietta. And I'm Bridget, and we are growing cut. We have been growing cut flowers for the last ten or twelve years, and um, we are garden designers as well. We are, we design uh, productive gardens and um, our real passion, uh, increasing passion is soil health. And um, we're on a mission to heal our soil. And we're, we have developed something called climate compost, which is um, we're hoping to be able to grow nutrient dense food and sequester carbon um, with it. So that is about to be launched in the next Yes, few months, and we are sort of stepping over the garden wall into farming. I've just started a farming partnership um, in Cornwall and up in Northamptonshire. Lovely. And then Jezza, my friend. Hey. Hello, how Can are you? you? Actually... Could you introduce me? Can you actually see yes, me? If you... We can, if you keep yourself away from the computer, we won't get the flashes of your beautiful children on your face as oh, much. That's goodness. a little right. bit better. 
Oh, oh yeah, sideways jazz. Okay. <laughs> Would you like to introduce yourself? Okay. Right. Well, look, just imagine that I fall into a swimming pool inside a car and I'm leaning at the top of the car to breathe. All right. Because that's what it looks like to me. <laughs> That'll do. That, that's a great introduction to your. Okay. So <laughs> I run the market garden. I organize about eight, nine people every day, busy, busy, trying to grow as much stuff as possible by co and, as, and causing as little harm to nature as possible. Um, and I will do as much as I can to help the brand of Dalesford. So I'm being shouted at in the background. No! Yes, there you go. No, go away! Sorry, I think I'm disturbing other people in this house. There you go. <laughs> so basically, you, you're in charge of growing all of our vegetables for us, aren't you? you know oh, I think we might have lost. No, I haven't. Um, no, stop it. I'm fine. What? Uh, I'm I've been stopped. Like, I think we've been reconnecting with, with nature. Um, so the first question, and this is open to all the panellists, why are we drawn to nature? I think, I think we're drawn to nature because we are, we are nature. We are part of nature. I think, you know... We, we've come to separate nature from ourselves. Um, but actually the natural world is in the evolutionary terms is our home, mm. is our habitat. It's, it's, you know, the brain, for example, evolved to function best in, <coughs> in, a, in, a, in keeping with certain stimuli in the natural world. Um, anyway, I won't say more than that, but that's, that's my take on, on that question. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really agree with what Sue's saying. And I think there's something about just being able to see like a vista. I think that's the thing. I, I, live, I personally live in London and feel that, that I just crave, you know, seeing fields or the sea or there's something really grounding um, about yeah. just having a, 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 a picturesque scene to look at and, uh, you know, and the grass under your feet. I think it's really kind of visible to be in nature. And your hands in the soil. Yeah. <laughs> That, that incredible feeling you have when you hand in your soul, which so many of us do as children, but then actually often we we move away from it. But it it does, yeah, there is something incredibly special about hands in the soil. And they, they say actually that, that gardeners are the happiest profession. I mean, the, the, the happiest profession. And there is a lot of science around the fact that there's a, there's a type of um, microbe in the soil that actually has a feel good factor even better than Prozac, so. Um, yeah, that, I, I write about that in my book, uh, Bridget. I'm not sure it's better than Prozac, but I think <laughs> gardening may be better than Prozac because gardening affects us on so many different, <clears throat> different levels. But there is a bacteria that is believed to, to increase levels of, of serotonin. It's called Mycobacterium vacci. Um, but on top of that, you know, the bacteria are also important because we're, we're enriching our own microbiome and we're coming to understand so much more and, and mainstream science is recognising much more the importance of the, of the gut microbiome and, it's, and, 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 and how when it's depleted, it play, that plays a role in various health problems. And gardeners have been shown to have a, a more diverse uh, gut microbiome than the non the non-gardeners and diversity in terms of gut means health so so there's a lot of there's a lot of substance to that i think i also think that in that way with the, the relationship between the gut and the um and nature is that nature sustains us completely from the food that we eat from everything that we make everything to us it completely looks after us and we are part of it we come from it we are dust to dust ashes to ashes but we are also sustained by it so we can't live without it it's nourishment in so many different ways 
beautifully put. Yeah, yeah. Abs- absolutely. I mean, what's always very striking dealing with food is that diversity is one of the basic predictors of somebody's long-term health, how many different foods they're eating, and the quality of the soil that... Uh, Well, I was slightly lost you there, but I think, um, I mean, that's something that uh, Sue and I... But Sue, this is absolutely the next of changes in our own mental health, dealing with nature. So can gardening really improve our mental health? Yeah, I mean, I, I spent five years researching this for my book, so I would say absolutely yes. And, and, and I think the great power of gardening uh, is the many, many different That's levels good. on which it works on us. So from the, the levels, like getting our hands in the soil, on the one hand, um, you know, the nutritional value of eating homegrown veg, being out in the sun, getting vitamin D, um, the, the anti-stress yeah, effects yeah. of green nature on us, you know, that's been heart rate and things like that but but also just simply the, the and very importantly the kind the um the deep connection we have with the cycle of life and and that for many people that's so sustaining and replenishing you know to be part of the 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 cycles of life in nature the the, the regeneration of plants and so on um so I think, I, anyway, I, I could say a lot about that, but I think there are many, many different ways in which gardening improves our, our well-being and, um, you know, it gives us a future, for example, as well. It helps us, gives us something to look forward to, and that's enormously important at the moment, particularly when people can't plan anything. You know, the one thing that hasn't been touched by the pandemic really is, is the natural world, and, and the seasons are still unfolding as they do. And, and we can sow our seeds and that gives us something to look forward to at the moment. There's that beautiful quote by Audrey Hepburn, to plant a garden is to believe in tomorrow. And I think hope is one of the most powerful emotions for humanity and to keep going. And I think that a garden can really provide a lot of hope. Yeah, yeah I, absolutely. I, com- I completely agree, Millie. I think, I think garden is also very good at bringing us into the present moment as well as giving us a future, um, you know, just the immersive experience of being in a garden, um, the meditative quality of some of the gardening tasks, you know, whether it's weeding or um, transplanting seedlings, um, you know, the, actually the connection between hand and brain and body and the focus, it's a kind of mindful focus really. Uh, all of that, I think, is very, very calming and, 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 and yeah, brings us into a connection with the world through our senses. And, and, you know, given that we're all, like we're doing this talk on Zoom, you know, we're all living much more of our lives because of the pandemic through, through our screens and our remote connections. And I think that's so valuable about gardening at the moment that we can, we can touch plants and get close to them, have an intimacy actually in the garden that um, is a bit harder in everyday life. Yeah, yeah I found that at the beginning of lockdown, uh, my team were completely kind of shocked about what it meant to not be able to uh, go about their life normally. And then I had no problem getting my staff to stay at work long hours and come in at the weekends because they realised that what their, their job at Delsa Market Garden was like, wow, this is, this is heaven. Yeah. We could, and the beginning of a lockdown was really quite warm and quite sunny. And the guys would just hang around the shed until about eight o'clock doing yoga, playing djembes. I mean, we do actually make cider in our shed. So they bought quite a bit of cider off us as well. But um, they, they kind of totally embraced horticultural life uh, because of lockdown and uh, it didn't really affect us at all much in the market garden to be honest we were really very lucky Um, I've got I had three people who at some stage in their life have been sectioned in my team of eight last year and you wouldn't know that when you're amongst them because they are all very busy 
um, occupied human beings. We are, I encourage all my staff to embrace what we grow because that's how you get them to care about what we grow. And so they all have, they all have predominantly vegan diets. And, uh, but the whole physicality, and we do encourage physicality because that generates appetite, it helps you sleep. Um, the whole physicality of the, of, of, of the market garden, it, it, uh, it revitalizes you. And um, I can't get, I, I don't, I never get enough of being physical. And that's what horticultural uh, occupation gives you that opportunity to be physical, creative and make a difference. And uh, I, I strongly believe in that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, I can I second everything that everyone said. And for, for me, my real love affair with gardening came at a time when, when I had just been um, diagnosed. Uh, and I, I, I think... Oh. oh, hello? We can hear you. We can hear oh, you. Yes, you. Um, um, and um, I literally, my, uh, my normal... You my normal kind of go-to for um, soothing was reading or kind of watching television. And I just couldn't do any of those things because of um, how, how I felt because of all my treatment. Um, and it was just specifically gardening for all the, for all the reasons that everyone's touched upon. Um, that really was my tonic and it is actually, you know, administered by mind. And, you know, there's so, there's so many gardening schemes specifically to help with mental health. So yeah, it's really, it really truly works and definitely for the physicality and to just take yourself out of your mind um, it is that meditative process and it definitely just in, enriches you in, in so many different ways. So yeah, I just wanted to say. Um, I, I think also something you mentioned in your book, Sue, which you must all read because it really is wonderful, um, is the pace of nature as well. Mm. I think as, as the sort of modern world speaks about around us and even having Zooms at night and all that technology and everything allow, allowing us to do things fast. Nature carries on at its own pace. And there's something very comforting and connecting about that. Um, it's yeah, that we are, we are forced to slow down. You know, the yeah. garden, we live in this sort of age of, you know, I don't know what sort of one click shopping and, you know, uh, get, yes, get, get, get things today or tomorrow and actually in the garden you have to be patient and, and and the pace of life is the pace of plants you know that's and and it does force you to slow down and I think that's that's enormously helpful in in this sort of 21st century that we're, we're living in. It totally depends how much land you've got to look after because if you can see <laughs> if you can see weeds going to corner in the back in the back border and you don't get to them this week, they're going to make yeah, a yeah, you can't keep up with the, the rest yes. of the season. <laughs> and, and you need a bigger hoe. <laughs> and and it also may it's sort of humbling in a way because mm. you know you sort of control well some of us can and some of us got more control than others but you know we sort of feel like we've got a lot of control over our lives but actually we can't control the um the environment we can't control if it's going to rain or not you know sometimes there's drought sometimes you just have to realize you can't mm. you yeah. can't you know you don't have a crop that year or or um or there's too much rain or there's not enough rain and in a way um it is humbling because yeah. you realize there's something much bigger than you out there and you have to fit in sometimes which is good for us Definitely. You can't always have perfect white roses in July. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so I think with um with all of our connection troubles, if oh dear. um hosts all turn their cameras off. Let's see if we can open up the broadband a little bit. This fabulous conversation <laughs> keeps fading in and out for our poor audience. Um, so, so let's let's talk a little bit more specifically. Not everybody um, 
not everybody has a garden, but everybody can probably do something to connect something green. And now that spring seems to have belatedly arrived, um, what do you think? What should we, what should I be doing at this time of year? Well, if you, you meaning if you don't have a garden? Planting all your tender, your frost sensitive. If you do or if you don't. Well, I think a really wonderful thing to yeah. do, if you do or you don't have a garden, is to, um, um, and we often say this when we run running courses with, you know, how to, how to create a flower garden through the year, is that we get people to put even little um, egg cups or little, little jugs on their table and make sure that every week they <coughs> find something to put in them. And even if you live in the middle of London, you know, we all walk past gardens or people's gardens and we can <laughs> snip off a little camellia or a, a bit of magnolia or some blossom. And if you bring it back and put it in your, um, in your vases, or it might be a little daisy out of the lawn or, or a bit of box hedging. And it's incredible. It really connects you into what's happening outside. And often you think there's nothing to pick, but if you really look out for it, you'll find something, even in the crack in the... Um, in the pavement. Um, and else thinking about this time of year? I think this is, I mean, I'm sowing seeds at the moment. I'm sure everybody is. And, and I think for me, that's always been one of the most um, exciting things. I think there's a magic in seeds germinating. It's uh, you know the, the the mystery of seeds and and how how for instance a sunflower, a little sunflower seed grows into a giant sunflower within a matter of months. Never. It's just such a wonderful thing to be part of and to watch and to to sort of facilitate that happening. So I think I think I would be saying seeds, sow some seeds. If you, if for people who haven't yet sown any seeds, do that. Yeah, I'm starting to uh, plant my frost tender species. So the first batch of sweet peas that I plant outside went out three weeks ago. They have been frosted about 20 times. Uh, so they're pretty much dead now. However, I've got some sweet peas in a, in a polythene tunnel, so they're great. But um, I have, I do do batches of these things. So I'm going to be planting out the sweet peas this week because frosts are over, guys. News. Yeah, that's good news, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. I will wait to plant my courgettes until not the end of next week, maybe the week after. But I've already put some sweet corn out. So uh, I, you learn to take risks. And that, those gambles, they're all part of the fun of um, and the, the risk taking that you that you kind of dabble with in horticulture. And you just have a backup. As long as you mm. have lots of seeds, then you do multiple sowings, then you can um, you either capitalize on the risk you take or you, you have some kind of um, second backup option, which is uh, always a good idea. I don't plant squash yet, by the way. A lot of people are getting into squash and pumpkins. I always find that when you're planting in a big field, there's a potential to get blown away by blown around by wind so we plant squash and pumpkins the second week of june but yeah that's something that people can get really into because they're very quick to germinate seed and it's not too late a lot of people think we're too late for sowing seeds but we're not at all no we're not too late no i agree <laughs> yeah there's still lots lots of time yeah i'm um planting out my dahlias um this month the last couple of weeks i've been putting them in and i'll continue to do that this week and daily cuttings will go in uh at the end of the month i'm sowing cosmos i'm also planting out ones that i've already sown um and all my grasses that i've been growing and i'll just continue to sow um and i'll start sowing beans uh at the end of the month there's still lots of time to do everything and harvest wise i'm it's the end of the tulips here and then the ranunculus are coming in and the anemones are still going um but it's also the best time of year i think to sort of take it all in because the burgeoning of, of growth is just miraculous and it's so easy to get um swept along with the outrageous amount of things to do and forget to watch all the leaves grow darker and more beautiful and the bluebells and yeah. so it's like a really good time to just soak up all the amazing growth I think. Oh, and yeah. 
another thing that's a great, amazing, liberating thing to do is just let your lawn grow and watch how many things actually come up in it. I mean, most of us just think there's grass, but there's, you know, there's violets and ladies' bed straw and yarrow and all sorts of things that little birds have dropped. Yeah, <laughs> so just let it grow. Yeah. We did that last year at home and it was just brilliant. And we had a sort of huge swathe of bird's foot treffle. It was so pretty. Mm -hmm. Um, and it is, it is no more May, isn't it? That, that's what we're going into now. It's, it's the month that, uh, to encourage all the pollinators and, and let, the, let the grass grow, as you say. And another thing that I would say is to take the opportunity to take pictures of your garden at every season. I find it really useful, especially when I've, you know, when the tulips are going back, I may not remember where they are. And yeah, so another tip is to just like take pictures at every season. It's really useful to look back on. Yes. Another plant that we really like for pollinators is for cilia. So that's one of the green manures and um, mm. that is just so easy to grow. You just literally sprinkle the seed down and it's just amazing for the soil because it has a little tap root that goes down. So it's really good for structure in the soil and then it will just be humming with bees. So we've just been planting that a lot in the um, garden. It's a great... What, what do you do then? Do you then dig it in in the autumn? You know, funny enough, we we uh, they say you sort of dig it in before it goes to flower, but we can never do that because the flowers are so beautiful and yeah. also so good for pollinators. So actually, what we do is we cut them down, so we leave the roots in the um, soil, and then we take all that bulk of green mass which we put in our compost, and then often what we'll do is we'll plant into that. So for us, it's it's super important never to see any. Um, bare earth because for us that's that um, the key to healthy soil is to have continually things growing in it so often you know even if we've got a short space between sowings we'll sow mustard or buckwheat or phacelia yeah. and even if it's just a little a haze of green mm. and then we sow into it um, you know cut it down sow into it that's enough because every little bit of photosynthesis is getting down into the roots and that's what's feeding the microlife and in turn, that's what's really building the humus in the soil, locking carbon in and releasing nutrients. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we uh, yes, it, it's almost like if we were cutting it down and putting it in, which we have tried, it's almost like it's too much to for the soil to digest. Yeah, yeah it's interesting because I did try green manure once, and when I when I tried to dig it in, it just seemed to create loads of problems. And I didn't realize this thing about cutting it down and just leaving the roots in the soil. You can you can put it in if you like, or sometimes what we'll do is we'll just lay it on the soil mm. and then put some compost on top. And funny enough, the, the heating process, because of course, something like that is full of nitrogen. Yeah. Um, and if you lie, lay it down and put some, not too thickly, um, and put some compost on top, they actually heats up when it starts to decompose. And sometimes we'll plant seed into that and it's like a little natural seed bed. Mm. Um, things like mustard can be a bit hot, but other, and sometimes, you know, things like salad growth is incredible. So, I mean, the whole time we're playing around with, um, with green manures and they're beautiful as well. And many people pick them and put them in your bouquets. Yeah. I do, I do. And I love it because it's self seed. If you let it go to seed, it self seeds everywhere. And I love a self seeder because I feel like it's loads of bounty for very little effort. <laughs> yes, I'm with you on that, Millie. I, I have lots of self seeders in my vegetable garden and I really celebrate them. I love them. And, and just for people who are not familiar with this plant, could we just repeat the name again? Sorry, it was Phacelia. P-H-A-C-E-L-I-A. -A. And there's many other green manures as well that you can use. And it depends on the time of the year when you can plant them. But things like phacelia, mustard, and buckwheat all could be planted from now on. Crimson clover, that's a really lovely one. Oh, it's beautiful. And white clover is another great thing if you're wanting to see Used in old teas for menstrual problems. Oh. Red clover. Oh. Well, Red clover is is a mild women's tea for premenstrual problems, but that that's a whole other world. But, um, and what about if somebody wants to revive a garden or start creating a garden? Okay, so um, we would say the 
biggest thing for um, getting soil activated and going is um, obviously having something growing in it. But to get something growing, often you need to get air into the soil. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean you need to turn it over and, and dig it up. But you can aerate the soil. And we use something called a broad fork, which is sort of like a, a sort of like a, a fork with lots of long tines. And we just ruffle it into the soil and to get some, um, to sort of fluff the soil up and get some air into it. Then we're putting in microbially rich compost and some water yeah. and start growing. That would be our recommendation. Yeah, but it'd be a good idea to get rid of all the perennial weeds first. Mm, I Otherwise, you're just going to end up nurturing those. Yeah, the, um, or the old cardboard trick. Or you can, yeah. surf, or yeah. you can surf cut. That's a really, mm. if you've got a really like a, even like a bit of lawn or very weedy, what we'll often do is we'll turf cut with a turf cutting machine and we take off the top inch of soil um, and, and weed seed. And that's really where all your weed seed bank is. Yeah. And then, and then once that's gone, funny enough, I mean, we've got beds that we've done that with that we really have very little weed problems, but the ones where we rotivated 10 years ago, yeah. free turf cutting, it's just a continual, like you say, Jez, a continual nightmare of weeding. Yeah, I mean, small gardens, especially in towns. I, I, I used to live in Reading and Victorian Terrace and ground elder is just everywhere and it's underneath the fences. It is very difficult not to be very interested in using a translocated herbicide such as Roundup in those situations. Uh, oh, however, we don't can... Don't don't. <laughs> don't do it. Obviously, obviously, darlings, are not of that nature. But, <laughs> so that's why we need to be just... But we do need to put a lot of effort into digging deeply, clearing out all the bindweed, elder, ground elder, bramble, cooch roots, and then, then start, because I made lots of mistakes sowing um, green manures into ground, but I convinced myself I prepared well, but you just end up nurturing the perennial weeds. The um, method I use is, is um, I have a lot of bindweed and bramble here and, um, and ground elder. And what I do is just a really thick layer of cardboard, either if it's a troublesome spot or a new spot, even straight onto grass. So like a couple of layers of cardboard in autumn, so it's got enough time to break down. And then just a couple of inches of compost. You don't even need the, some, if it's really bad, I'll put a really thick layer of compost, but just a couple of inches. And then by the time spring comes around and it's ready for planting, I have uh, the, the perennial weeds have been weakened so much that when they pop up, I'll just take them out with a trowel as they come up. Um, I'll take the biggest bits of um, bramble and things like that out with a spade before I do this. But I have had 80% less trouble with it after using that method. I really, I really swear by the, the cardboard and, and compost mulch. We're yeah. just we're just doing it in our in our new project in an orchard um, where Tom and his design studio are creating a plant library, um, and uh, it's a sort of our first our first attempt at no dig. So it's a bit too early to say whether it's been a full success. But we've done one season, and it does. I mean, it does seem to have worked. So I think, yeah, I think I think anyway, it'd be interesting to see. Um, Kat, very little Kat watering as well. Wondering, yeah, very little. Sorry, Kat is just wondering if it is too late to plant up a new garden area from scratch with hedging, agapanthus, lavender, or is June a good time of year to do this? The best time is is autumn, but it's never too late. I think if you if you can create a garden any time of year from scratch. Um, yes, although I wouldn't be putting hedging in now. Um, I think probably wait till the autumn on that or mm -hmm. early spring. Yeah, early. Yeah, I, really after the middle of um, April, it's pretty tough putting anything woody into uh, the ground. I mean, it's quite unless you've got an incredibly good watering system. Yeah, you want to do it between October and March, really. Uh, things like hedges or trees, ideally, or shrubs. Uh, but but uh, he or she could put in lots of annuals now. Mm. This summer, That's what I do. Yeah. 
perennials in the autumn. So um, should we all be going peat free? Definitely. Yes. Absolutely. That's a quick one. <laughs> <laughs> and on, that, on that note, and um, I've been looking for the best peat free compost because it's actually, it doesn't, they don't make it easy for you to find it. Um, no. it's, um, a great one. Oh, gosh, I wish I could remember the name. Sorry. Um, but it's made from sheep's wool and bracken, which I feel like for our... Barefoot. That's it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Jess. That's what we use. Is it? Oh, great. I, I've used that equipment. as well. Yeah. And I feel like those are natural resources, natural waste products that we have in the UK. So it's, it's a beautiful so story, isn't it? Yeah. It, and it's much more convincing than the Qua story, where yeah. the Qua comes from the other side of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we use the um, Dalefoot double strength and we mix that with the compost that we make on site and the adding the Dalesfoot just gives you that extra confidence that you've got that extra food in there. Uh, what I will say is that naturally I we tend to make uh, quite a rough compost and it does hold moisture a little bit too well. So we have to add grit as well to make it much better. But yeah, Dale's foot is a, a great one. It's very complicated. I just constantly being confused with Dale's foot and Dale's foot though. Yeah. <laughs> Easy mistake. You can bring Dale's foot at Dale's foot, surely, and say it 10 times. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, we'll, we, could, we could send you all uh, on the panel, maybe not everyone on the Zoom, but who knows. Uh, some of our climate compost, which we've made, yes. and which will soon be up to sell. Yes. Uh, you, I have to say, uh, you have to pass so many ticks, so many boxes to uh, sell anything like compost in this country. Yeah. Because they're so fearful you're going to spread the plague. Um, but we've just about got the last box ticked, and we could send you that. We've been working on that for for well for many years, and it is teeming with life i so we've just had the results back from um the scientists and we're really really excited with what the results so um that we'll, we'll send you all some and not, not oh god that sounds fantastic that'd be amazing wow. oh, yeah. i'm thrilled i'm starting my video for that one <laughs> <laughs> the really exciting thing is actually we we took baseline studies of the yeah. soil here sort of 12 years ago and um, and we've just had results back doing a very broad um, um, research. And um, the carbon has gone from 5% to 15%, and in some parts, 23%, which actually the guy wow. doing the test said he's never seen any results like this in the UK, and that we should be bagging our um, walled garden soil as fertilizer. So. Oh. Um, it's really surprising yeah, for us because it's it's something where we're getting nature to do all the work um, and just providing the right atmos you know, atmosphere mm -hmm. and environment for it to work. And, and um, I mean, it's, yeah, it's... it's well, what are the main ingredients? <laughs> just, just before you answer that, can I just clarify to all of our lovely guests with us, I'm so sorry that was an offer to the panellists. They're not able to share it all with everybody, but you will be selling it, won't you? We oh, will. Yeah. Yes, we will. Yeah. And so if you haven't been to the Land Garden, in fact, everybody's website is just a joy to go to. Um, but certainly if you go to their website, you can pre-order, am I right? Yes. Yes. Yes, so, and, and get hold of this. Jezra, I'm so sorry, please continue. Oh, I'm just intrigued to know what the ingredients are. However, I also know in the compost world, it could be a secret. No, no, it's no. not a secret. <laughs> Our whole we thing. Want teach <laughs> we want, and the thing is, we want to teach Inherently teach generous. No, no, Gardeners no. are inherently generous, I think. But oh, sorry, yeah. No, no, it's, it's extremely important for us, actually. For our success, there's lots of people doing it. And... Um, and we were we're super happy to tell anyone it's but in, it's basically a ratio of carbon and nitrogen slightly more carbon to nitrogen it's really important to have some clay in there so 10 percent of clay that is the home for the microbes and also a source of minerals water air and old compost and old compost like some an sort inoculum. Of inoculum. so you feel and the thing is, is we it's it's almost like we're providing an incredible environment for the micro life to proliferate as they proliferate, they digest 
the organic matter and, and we keep it at, at temperatures between 58 and 65 degrees, killing the bad bugs and also not killing the good bugs. And what else do we do? We turn it quite a lot at the beginning to keep the air in it. Yeah. You must oxygenate it. Yeah. But Jose, we'd love to we'd love to come and you know talk to you about it at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'd I'd love to see. I love. What, what's your magic ingredient though? Is it straw or is it? The magic ingredient is is the is well. First of all, the clay, uh, because as Bridgie said, that acts as a home for the microbes, the home for the food for the microbes. But actually, it's the process. It's okay. It's the the ingredients for life so food oxygen moisture um and the right temperature and so um, it's the it, it's the process of how we do it and the really incredibly important thing is is the source of what where we get our uh yeah. ingredients from because um i mean we're an organic but it's incredibly important that you don't put things into it that are going to harm the microbes or us um, one thing that's come up recently, and which is why I actually personally am not buying any compost, if I can, from anyone else, unless I know that they are certified organic, is because there's something called amino pyrrolid that turns up in um, uh, sort of broadleaf sprays, yeah. which can, can, can get into pastures. Um, it doesn't even get denatured when it goes through the gut of a horses or, or cows. And so a lot of that um, is coming back through into our compost, uh, compost and you're getting stunted growth and torted um, leaves. And I mean, uh, there's been a huge, you know, a lot of people have had real issues, even with some of the best compost out there. And I think that that's something about, people are, are used to thinking about um, pesticides, but even in the time that I've been on food, but even in the time that I've been in the UK around gardening, it's become, um, it's become much more important and it's hard to imagine how long the half-life of some of these pesticides is and how they linger, mm. you know. So, so we're still dealing in our little London garden with some of the things that must have been done in the 70s, I would imagine, you know, 70s yeah. and 80s. Right. But um, I, think that, I think that we can, the conversation will flow quite fluidly because the next question is, is what is one thing we can all do to make our gardens a little more eco-friendly? Well, I think stopping mowing the lawn, that was pretty much nailed it. Yeah, that's <laughs> a good one. Yeah. Um, and then the you... of mess, don't be worried too much about the weeds. Yeah, weeds are better than bare earth, so let yeah. them go because the more diversity you have in the garden, the more diversity of life underneath the soil and the more diversity of life under the soil means that there's more um, ability to to store carbon and to produce you know healthy plants and your weeds that is of course and if you um if you mulch so it's it's sort of not letting the bare earth in the same way either have plants or mulch it and you won't have to water so much um which saves water usage and collect rainwater so that you're not using so much uh, mains water. And the the other thing is 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 not sort of tidying up too much, isn't it? It yeah. is having corners of, you know, rotting twigs and things like that that provide a habitat. And you know, there's such um, oh, you know, over the generations, really, there there's a sort of aesthetic. Uh, cu a culture of the kind of neat and tidy garden and, and a sense of, I think, in, you know, in many urban environments, a sense of sort of civic pride or neatness or something that goes with that, a feeling that you're letting the side down if your garden isn't looking very sort of neat and tidy. And I think there's actually a really important issue at stake about shifting that aesthetic towards something that is more about supporting all the, all the life forms on which we, we all ultimately depend, actually. Um, that's supporting them. Um, I think most gardening is just, that. I think most gardening is um, you have order and chaos and nature creates a chaos which is generally quite beautiful and you can go in there and tweak it occasionally if for example you've got a, a heavy rain and a, a shrub at the back of the border has got too much growth on it flops over the flowers at the front you go and trim it out but in the borders you can tolerate all sorts of 
nonsense going on as long as you sweep the path. When I was a gardener, the, the, the most effective part of my job would be to sweep a path at the end of the day. And it would be a, a small fraction of what I do, but the, but the client would always go, oh, wow, the garden looks great because the path is clean. So there's this order element and then the rest of it can be chaos. And it, that's fine because you, you've, 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 you've made your statements, you've asserted control over the space and, and you feel like it is tidy because that, the bit that you use the most is, is cleansed. That's really yeah. interesting, that observation, I think. Um, I, I, the other point that's really worth making about, you know, encouraging um, biodiversity is that in terms of mental health, the evidence is that the more complex, um, the, the, you know, the more uh, biodiverse an environment is and the more complexity of planting in it, the more restorative it is and the more that it engages us. Um, you know, the more sensory stimulation there is as well. So, so you know, it's, it's actually better for us too um, in terms of the replenishment that we can experience in that kind of setting. And there's this sort of thrilling parallel, I think, in nutrition, which is my world, where we've had the hygiene hypothesis, where there have been more allergies and other problems because things have been too neat and tidy in the home and in the places that children have been playing so the fact that the gardens i mean this is beginning to to get us into a discussion about rewilding and one of i just um was lecturing a, a in a nutrition degree when we were talking about um obesity and diets and i had to bring rewilding in as one of the things that helps stabilize you know some greenness a bit of wildness a bit of a bit of um nature can help stabilize a lot of imbalances in our urban life and so should we be rewilding parts of our gardens yeah I definitely think so I think I think coming from somebody who lives in London I think there's a slight still of obsession with kind of having borders and then lawn and I personally if I didn't have a dog I would absolutely have no lawn at all and just you know give it back to nature and I think that's really where I'm sure everyone will agree where we should be kind of going I think there's a there's something very beautiful about having wild corners not not it brings in wildlife you know your your garden will be filled with songbirds and all sorts of lovely things and um, the, the chicest that I've ever seen it is butter wakefields little meadows in the middle of your lawn I think that's just gorgeous you know, have a proper little wildflower meadow in, in yes, on somebody a... mentioned meadowfying your garden meadowfying your lawn letting no mow may sounds like a great idea doesn't it yeah and when we wanted to get some more garden supplies in where should we well we now know where to get our compost from but where should we be buying our our plants and our seeds well, um, Real Seed, there's a Real yeah. Seed company, is, is a wonderful place to get, especially vegetable seeds and all the heirloom seeds. Yes. And um, I just love reading all the little descriptions of where they've come from and how they've been bred. Um, but they're, they're definitely, you know, really wonderful. And mm. try, to, try to avoid any F1 because it, um, the more research that we've done about seeds is that if they've been fiddled with or tampered with, then they're not fully communicating with their natural environment. And so you're not going to get as much um, from that seed as you could if it was a complete whole naturally pollinated seed. But also you won't be able to collect the seed, will you? And, 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 and you know, save it and, and then germinate it the next year. The great thing about the real seed company is that they have, with every single packet, they send instructions on how to save that specific variety. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that's the thing. Find the people that you that you want to support to buy from that you believe in and then save those seeds because the strongest and healthiest plants that you'll get will be things that have already thrived in your garden. Yeah, it's been a real struggle this year to get all the seeds I normally would get. So we, we always, I always use Tamar organic seed as my first port of call because they only stock organic seed. And if you're an organic grower, you have to pursue organic uh, seed first before you get allowed by the Soil Association to use non-organic seeds. But um, there's Vital Seed in Totnes that have recently turned up and they're a bit like real seed, quite limited, but 
that they have got some really well trialled uh, open pollinator varieties and the seed cooperative as well they've been really useful mm. amazing and then just on just on a cut flower note as well if anyone kind of really wants to start thinking about where they get their cut flowers from flowers from the farm is an amazing website where you can literally go on and find a lot of independent and um, incredible producers and flower farmers, uh, which I try and do if I do an event or wedding um, outside of London, mm. I always try and source my flowers from somebody, you know, local who's doing it brilliantly. And there's a map, so it makes it really easy. So you can just type in a postcode and find your nearest yeah. one. And there's over a thousand members now, so there's there's likely one close to you. Yeah, I think, I think, just before we move on to the questions, it was, it was one of the things that Hazel and I touched on, but, but for both Hazel and Millie, I still think that flowers is one of the big invisible destructive um, industries. Could one or both of you talk about that a little bit more and how the work that you do contrasts with that? Yeah, I mean, for, for me, it's just, we were saying that it's just like purely educating people. I We were touched upon how the food, um, you know, the food industry has done very, very well with promoting the correct messaging of what we should eat se seasonally um, and people should be really mindful of the provenance of their food. And with flowers, I'm sure that Millie um, agrees, it's we've got such a long way to go. Um, also, you know, working with clients, a lot of the time the briefs are out of season and I have to kind of really champion why I refuse to kind of provide you with a tulip in, you know, in a, a, a month that it's just not going to grow. Um, also, there's a huge kind of disconnect with people uh, with cost, I think. Um, I think the supermarkets, you can, you know, I'm really about everyone being able to afford um, flowers and making them accessible. But unfortunately, what we've seen happen is lots of the supermarkets, uh, you know, sell a, a wrap of flowers seemingly for eight pounds. And then when people kind of see them from a florist or myself or Millie, they might question why I'm spending slightly more. But, you know, you have to educate people that it's you know uh, grown not flown is the term that we use and uh, there's such a quality in terms of how it's grown what's been put into that and fragrance a lot of cut flowers that are shipped in will just completely be um, produced to have no fragrance because then they will last longer. So there's all of this, this is just like a 50 second soundbite and I think that's what we need to kind of get across. <laughs> I, I worked in a florist in London and I, I couldn't believe, I put together the dots of food provenance because that had been a part of a bigger conversation that had got through to me. But I, I just hadn't put together the, the dots with flowers. And I worked in a florist and realized that things were being shipped in and refrigerated and in, covered in plastic. And I was so shocked. I mean, I was so naive that something that could, flowers that are supposed to be so natural and so beautiful or doing such damage every day endlessly to the environment that then growing flowers is my reaction to that to yeah. to to sort of counter that and even it's it's a tricky thing because it does um the costs are different growing flowers is expensive mm -hmm. but just one stem of a tulip that then grows in the vase and morphs and dances for you is just so different from the, the, a, a tulip retail, retail price will be grown in UK is about one pound fifty to two pounds, and for a bunch that you can get for three pounds, I think you'll get so much more joy from that one stem than a bunch from the supermarkets that won't dance for you. Yeah. Exactly, it's quite ridiculous, but it's true. They do. It's true. It's definitely true. <laughs> I think, I think uh, a really important thing, though, is that you've got to realise is that the, the chemicals that are used on cut flowers are not regulated. So, you know, your food that you buy, even if it's not organic, there are some regulations around the, the poisons that they can put on. So, you know, what's the first thing you do when you get given a bunch of roses or a bunch of sweet peas is that you plunge your nose into it and then you put it on your table. Well, actually, there's some chemicals that are that are associated with all sorts of horrible things that that you know are not, are not regulated. So don't don't smell your, your, your flowers or touch them. I'm I'm so sorry we've got so many you you must if you want and the other side of this too and I promise I'll get to you is I think just like with food Jezza when some of the other the old vegetables have got so much flavor but they don't travel so well some of the floristry that 
that you two do um, with cut flowers that you wouldn't necessarily see the same kind of things in the sort of retail environment because you don't have to think about huge plane trips for your flowers and the, oh anyway I, I wax lyrical but I have to get on to our questions now I've got a quick one about sweet peas do they come um, true from seed they do just plant them as slightly apart and um, make sure that you label them but they can they can come true from seed yeah Great. They're, they're a good and one. We also had from Jemima a question about no dig, which we all sort of talked about for a little bit without really calling it no dig. Millie, when you were talking about your cardboard. So that's a no dig approach, isn't it? That you found very beneficial. Yeah, I'm on year four of no dig and I've done um, three different sites with no dig um, within my local area. And uh, it's been an ama it's been amazing. What the latest I did was a April. I laid down the cardboard and I had the most incredible crop by July, August, September. But it is for me. It's I'm on heavy, heavy clay in West Sussex, and um, it holds nutrients. But it's it's really impossible to dig in. And I'm only five foot three and a half, and it's already a laborious <laughs> thing working a garden. So for me moving compost from one place to another is enough and um, and it has changed the way um my it changed my relationship with the garden it's changed the, my the health of my crops the soil structure is unbelievable i don't have to water at all i'm on clay though so it retains moisture better anyway but the mulch acts as a barrier and it drains better so come winter i don't have big pools of water killing my plants um, I don't have to fertilize it at all that's enough the compost acts as a great feed um, for very hungry plants I might give them a comfrey um, tea um, but I don't have to weed and that's the biggest thing because yes. when it comes to summer and I'm harvesting and creating for events and I'm so busy I can barely breathe um, the first year that I was when I was doing this professionally I was couldn't keep on top of the weeds and I just it was like de almost devastating and made me want to give up um, and they were just swallowing my crop and um, this means that I don't have to battle with weeds um, I know that the soil's being fed and looked after yeah, and so I'm on London clay as well and I yeah. think no weed is is brilliant um what about the best material Jezza this might be for you to make a path in a veg patch we only have two more minutes to go. Uh, I guess wood chip, if you get nice and deep, uh, but it needs to be a good, like um, 15, 20 centimetres deep so it can last the season. Essentially, you don't really want the wood chip to get into your growing borders because it locks up nutrition. But um, in the long run, it will rot down and provide compost. It will inoculate your, your beds with um, mycorrhizal fungi. Um, but if it's nice and deep, then it will essentially suppress most perennial weeds and any perennial we weeds that come up through it will be weak enough to be able to pull out easily. And I think that there's one last question which deserves to be our last question, but I just want to remind everyone before I go on to Rachel's question that there are upcoming workshops um, the land gardeners have got some upcoming workshops. Hazel, I think you've got some with us. Yes. And also Sue's book, even as an audio book, to go for a long walk with Sue's book is something I heartily recommend for the mental health of every single person here. I think your book is wonderful and I could easily have another two hours with all of you. We've barely scratch the surface um but please do have a look at the workshops that we're running please go to everybody's website and please do get um do get sue's book it's it's wonderful um and the final question was from rachel hi everyone i'm becoming utterly obsessed with gardening and growing from seed we are all thrilled to hear that rachel at the minute i only have balcony and window sills what can i grow so much salad salad's a great thing <laughs> herbs i mean culinary herbs that you can't buy in the supermarket you grow wonderful from annual herbs from seed yeah, it's all about how big a, a bunch of containers you can fill compost with. So 
it depends how high you have to take the compost a lot of the time because that is the biggest pain in the neck getting the compost the growing media up there but if you but if it's a nice warm south facing balcony then you're laughing you can grow chilies tomatoes outdoor cucumbers but you need large volumes otherwise they will dry out in the hot sun if it's too hot up there yeah oh look thank you everybody i would um yeah i would love to to <laughs> love to be with you all for easily another hour um so and thank you everybody for joining us and and being patient with us through our sort of our janky reception right at the beginning <laughs> of the of the discussion and to our amazing um panel of gifted women and jezza <laughs> and thank you all for joining us and we will have our next delsford dis um discussers in um june i think it is and so thanks again, everybody, and good night.